I had met this very, very beautiful woman and strange and crazily enough, like within a very short period of time, she had gotten pregnant. And the secret that I had kept from her was that I had relapsed on heroin. Hey, Secret Life podcast listeners. This is Tab and Gretch from Housewives of True Crime. We know you like juicy secrets and hearing the fascinating tales of people's lives. So we think you would love our true crime stories. Every week we give you a new episode of True Crime on the Lighter Side so you can sleep at night. We are two friends that love comedy, sharing a little bit about our lives. And we know that you will also become our BFFs too. So check us out at Housewives of True Crime. Clink, clink. If you look around, there are so many ways to make a difference. At Capella University, our FlexPath format gives you a different way to earn your degree. Take courses at your speed. Move on whenever you're ready. Education should fit your life. Learn more at capella.edu. Introducing Under Armour's Infinity High Sports Bra. Its ergonomic design is molded to support the natural movement of your body. With cord-out padding, the better breathability eliminates extra bulk without sacrificing support. And quick dry padding is Under Armour's fastest drying padding yet. When you're lifting heavy, running fast, and pushing yourself further than ever before, you need a bra that will help you go that extra mile and make you feel your best. Shop the Infinity High Sports Bra now at UA.com. Welcome to the Secret Life Podcast. Tell me your secret. I'll tell you mine. Sometimes you have to go through the darkness to reach the light. That's what I did. After 12 years of recovery in sex and love addiction, I finally found my soulmate, myself. Please join me in my novel, Secret Life of a Hollywood Sex and Love Addict, a four-time bestseller on Amazon. It's a brutal, honest, raw, gnarly ride, but hilarious at the same time. Check it out now on Amazon. Welcome to Secret Life Podcast. I'm Brianne davis Gant. Today, I'm pulling back the curtains of all kinds of human secrets. We'll hear about what people are hiding from themselves or others. You know, those deep, dark secrets you probably want to take to your grave? Or those lighter, funnier secrets that are just plain embarrassing? Really, the how, what, when, where, and why of it all. Today, my guest is Dave. Now, Dave, I have a question for you. Dun, dun, dun. What is your secret? One secret that I kept was, it was pretty painful actually. It was that I had met this very, very beautiful woman and strange and crazily enough, like within a very short period of time, she had gotten pregnant. And the secret that I had kept from her was that I had relapsed on heroin. It was uh, very scary. You know, mm-hmm. it was a very, very scary time. And I, I mean, I kept that secret from everybody because it was like, maybe people knew, but I don't think they knew. I think they were just hoping for the best because when you're dealing with a heroin addict, you kind of, you count them out a little bit Mm -hmm. and you kind of just assume they're going to be using anyway. But my partner at the time, her name is Linda, Mm -hmm. you know, she was kind of betting on our kid's life that I wasn't. So I do want to go back. So were you using heroin when you got her pregnant or did you start using it after she got pregnant? I wasn't I wasn't using it when I got I mean, I don't think the night I got her pregnant, I was using it. I relapsed like it was like I I had I had been on heroin for many, many, many years. Mm -hmm. And and then I got on methadone for Mm -hmm. many years. Mm -hmm. And um and I lived in Los Angeles, California, uh, but I was from New York City. I'm from Manhattan. Mm-hmm. And my mother uh, contracted leukemia and she, and, and she kind of knew she was going to die. Yeah. And she said, uh, she said, I'm going to die. And I and I made a decision at that moment that I was going to get off methadone and uh, and go back to New York because I'd been in in Los Angeles for six years or seven years. It's hard even to remember. I was so like sketched out in my brain, 
that um, that I I was like, I'm coming home. I've, I've lost too much time. And I went home. I got off methadone. It took me like a year to get off methadone, got off heroin. People say it's harder. You know what I mean? But like, I've never been one to try to quantify it. It's all bad. You know, getting <laughs> off of heroin is bad. Getting off of methadone was bad. It's just, it, it was like, it was, it was, it was easier for me to get off methadone only because somebody doled it out to me every day. Mm. So like, because somebody doled it out to me every day. And I said to that person, I want to get off methadone. Can you dole me out 10 milligrams less a time or one milligram less a time? So it was out of my control. So in that way, mm-hmm. it was easier. But methadone, I think the chemistry in methadone is that it has a longer half-life. So it stays in your body much longer. Yeah, um, It's synthetic. It affects you psychologically differently. And, and so I wouldn't, I mean, in terms of just facilitating getting off of a drug, it was easier for me than yeah. heroin because somebody did it for me. You know, um, I wound up coming home, getting off of all that stuff. I still smoked weed. Uh, I, I wound up in Manhattan uh, working in a deli mm-hmm. and, and, um, and I met this woman and uh, when I had met her, the I had met her when I was 23. We re-met when I was like 35. So it was 13 years later. And I had, and she knew, like she was very close with one of my friends who was totally strung out. She knew. And, and the first time I got together with her, I told her like, I like blabbed my whole life story to her. So she knew, I'm so fucked up. I'm a great, and she's like a social worker. She's a therapist. I think she like likes the, the she liked the ride of yeah. it right and um and like for for a social worker or a therapist like to be a heroin addict is almost an aphrodisiac to them because there's so much there for them to there's deal with so much to dig and like fix and help and we can get we can get you through this you don't have to use the drug all that stuff yeah it's intoxicating yeah. right because on the other side being of service now like you are and i am it's that's like the best tie in the world so i believe social workers and feel that as well. When they help somebody, it's this high that you helped them. Do you agree or disagree? I agree, but I've never given her the credit for that. It's funny you saying that I've never even considered that the work she does is as important as the work I do. Um, But it's true. Absolutely. (laughs) Like she, yeah, it's a hundred, it's a really good point. I never, I never even thought of that. And I'm, I've been with her for a long time. So that means like, I'm just still very self-centered and selfish. In my, Aren't in my we approach. all underneath? My husband and I were both a little selfish at times. Still addicts. You're still selfish and self-seeking, but yay. You're yes. still with her. You that just was... gave us like the plot twist. You're still with her. Yeah. Yeah. And she's, um, and she's doing really, really good work right now. So it's, I, I'm going to share this with her when I get oh, home. She'll, she'll, She'll enjoy, she'll enjoy this, this story. Yeah, I ruined it. Spoiler alert. We're, we're, Spoiler we got back alert. Together. It's Sorry. okay, but go Sorry. back. So you re-met her 13 years we later. Re-met, mm-hmm. We re-met at a bar. Mm-hmm. Um, we did coke that night. Mm-hmm. Like I, I told her she was taking me home with her that night. And she was like, what? And I was like, we're going, this is it. This is oh what's happening. I was oh my like, God. It's like classic love bombing of an addict. I love it. I love it. <laughs> Yeah, it was like that. And um, but I wasn't using heroin. I was smoking weed. I didn't even like Coke. I did it with her. Then she had like she had benzos at her house. Like uh, she was prescribed Ativan Mm -hmm. and I'm like a neurotic Jew. So Ativan is like the secret sauce for me. That kind of that kind of a drug is like probably the perfect drug for me. Um, so I was like, wow. And she's got, she's beautiful. And she's got benzos. And it's like, that sounds good. She was and the complete so like, package for you. Yeah. That's everything I ever wanted. It's totally all <laughs> happening. So, um, so like we, and, and she didn't really want to get into a relationship with me. I was like, this is the most beautiful girl I've ever seen. Uh, I want to keep her, you know what I mean? The second, the second I, I was like with her, I was like, I don't, I don't want to lose this. This is like, I want this, you know, I like want it. It was like, it was almost materialistic. It was like, I yeah, wanted it's like her. a pedestal. I went to own her. Like she was a possession, you know, yes. someone's yeah, beauty, a, is a possession, you know, they become an object, especially as an addict. We do that. Well, we the take, idea, right. And, yes. But no, we please. take people hostage, right? Like there's a part of us that want to take people hostage and become a part of them because inside we're not complete. So we like, 
eat them almost alive. Does that make sense? I don't know if you do that, but I used to do that all the time. (laughs) No, I think for me, I felt so grotesque, Mm. so unlovable and disgusting that the idea that this ridiculously hot woman would be with me. I was like, I do not want to lose this opportunity. I was like, this is, this is like, this is like the shortcut to me being okay with myself because this woman is okay with me. You know, and I was, and it was everything that I needed to validate myself. You know, I wasn't using, and we started dating. And then I remember I did the same thing, like the way I, I never heard love bombed either, but I, the way I love bombed to get home, I remember very, very shortly into our relationship, I was like, you're going to be my girlfriend. This, and I never was like that, but I was like, you're going to be my girlfriend and this is going to be how it happens. And she's like, no, I'm not. But I think she actually liked it. I think she liked that I was so like, committed and I wasn't going to play games and it was just going to be like, let's just do this. And yeah, um, I mean, it is intoxicating that intensity, right. That comes on and she is feeling wanted and obviously she's attracted to you, but, but that intensity is not real in a way it isn't because it is another form of high. You were just snorting her. You were just shooting up her, her energy so desperate I yeah. was so desperate that if I didn't have her like I would be lost and it's funny like to look back at it because I'm ta- that was what the story I'm talking about was uh 12 and a half years ago this happened and um and we started like seeing each other constantly and like basically living with each other without living with each other and and we, and I was drinking, like I never drank, like I wasn't a drinker. She liked to drink and I was drinking and I was like, and we were bickering, right? Mm-hmm. We were drinking and bickering. And then the next thing I knew she was pregnant mm-hmm. and I was like, I, I like, I like fell down. Like when she told me, I think I fell down a flight of stairs. <laughs> like, I think I fell down a flight of stairs uh, on 23rd <laughs> street at the end train station. It was like raining and I like fell down the stairs. I remember when she, t- I work in a very, very famous restaurant in Manhattan okay. uh, called Cat's Deli. So how it's a, like, it's the deli where when Harry met Sally, where, where yeah, Harry. Yeah, I know which deli it is. Yeah. I've yeah. been there. <laughs> so I, I still work there. And, um, I remember I was sitting in the back corner of the room and I'm on one of these shitty flip phones with her. And it was like a horror movie when she told me it was like, you know, that thing where the camera pulls back and the depth of feel. it was like, I was like that. And I was like, Holy fucking shit. I can't believe it. Like, what do I do? But then also part of me was like, well, I get to keep this beautiful woman. Like maybe I should just go with it. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's and, that duality um, of like the good and the evil, like sides of you. You're like, ah, and then like, oh, but now she's like mine. Like now we're like but bonded. It's, it's, but it's both kind of evil, right? It's yes. like, it's like total fear that I can't, I, I certainly was not like cut out to be a father at that point. I was like heroin addict, worked in a deli, like not like, still smoking pot. Like I wasn't cut out to do it. And then also I barely knew her was just like, like wanted her to be mine. Like I wasn't really like, I was like all fucked up about what was happening. And then like, bam, we like did it. We were like, we're going to do it. And that was it. And um, in retrospect, I always said that uh, we were an arranged marriage by our daughter like our daughter arranged our marriage, like an Indian kind of thing or something, you know, like an arranged. But meanwhile, I'm fucking bugged out and scared to death. Yeah. I think if memory serves me correctly, mm-hmm. it was Christmas and Linda had bought me the Nikki Six memoir, The Heroin Diaries, which was not the smartest book <laughs> to buy me. <laughs> like, is that the worst gift ever? Right. Linda, not, what are you yeah. thinking? <laughs> And I remember I'm taking the end train to, mm-hmm. to Prince Street mm-hmm. and I get off at Prince Street and I'm walking over to Katz's and there, it, there's a methadone clinic nearby and everybody's on the street. And I'm like, I, I feel it like it's like the call of the wild kind of thing. Yeah. And all I have to hear is one thing. And I hear sticks and what sticks were were two milligram Xanax, like like bars. And I was like, I, I should buy a couple. They're cheap. I have money. I wasn't thinking what that would do. Right. I bought five Xanax on the street because I just read about Nikki Six on fucking tour doing heroin or whatever. And uh, I bought them. And then 
And then as soon as I started taking them, it was like, bam. And I, and I still didn't want to do dope. Yeah. I didn't want to do dope, but I, but I, uh, I kept it to myself. That was the secret. But wait, I want to, there's people that have never done drugs. Like, so what happened in that matter of seconds when you hear, hear sticks, like, did you go into another place? Did you automatically just like that feeling? Can you describe it? I know it was a while ago, but people I don't can. understand as an addict when you say you don't want to do something and then you find yourself doing it two minutes later. Yeah, I mean. I was such a long-term drug addict and, Mm -hmm. and, and for the most part, I I didn't have any money. I was living codependently with another woman uh, who paid for my drugs for years. And Mm -hmm. I was, I didn't work for years. And she, I know, I can, I know you can see what a, you know, what a trophy boyfriend I must've been. What a catch. Um, What a catch catch I was. What a catch I was. Hey, listen, Um, I've done some shitty, shitty, bad things in, in my addiction. I totally get it where you're like, I wasn't, I was a piece, like a piece of, work back then you know no I was like a house cat my ex-girlfriend had two house cats and I was the third cat in the house and I wore a bathrobe and I did nothing all I would do is like I lived in Echo Park I would like walk down a hill and buy ice cream sandwiches for 50 cents a piece and walk back and eat them and then I would look in the couch cushions for more change to buy more ice cream sandwiches that was my life after methadone and Xanax that was it no, it was, I, I, I was like, I could do like six ice cream sandwiches a day on top of like 10, 10 Xanax and 150 milligrams of methadone and whatever heroin and weed. But that's not the point. The point is I was conditioned to doing drugs. And like I said before, I'm a neurotic New York City Jew mm-hmm. and, and drug and benzos mm-hmm. are the perfect thing for that brain. So like when I'm on the street going to Katz's, you know, fairly sober. I hadn't done a benzo in about a year or something. And I heard sticks and I had money in my pocket and I had money in a bank account. And I was like, and I, I think she was, he was selling thanks for a dollar, you know, a dollar. I was like, I can buy five. Like, what's the difference? You know, I did not think about what addiction was and what it would do to me in that moment once I bought it. But when I had it, like I was so excited Like I was so excited that I was going to have peace for five bucks. I was going to get exactly where I wanted to get to for five bucks. And I had that denial lie in my head that because I had money in my pocket, I was going to be okay. It was going to be different, you know? And, um, and that wasn't the case. And like, and then from there, the guy who had introduced me to Linda Mm -hmm. somehow came over with heroin to our house and told me, and Linda's pregnant and he Mm -hmm. has heroin for me. Um, and, uh, and we didn't tell her and she would go to bed early and me and him would like watch reruns of 90210 and I would shoot dope and he would snort it. And like, that's how glamorous we were. That's how like bad boys we were. We would watch 90210 and, and do heroin. And, um, and I do it like make sure it's do it once a week, blah, blah, blah. And, and, and her belly's getting bigger and we're getting closer to the birth. And I remember when, um, she gave birth. Mm-hmm. The night she gave birth, I, I didn't stay at the hospital with her. She was like, will you stay at the hospital? And I'm like, no, I think I should go home and clean the house. And uh, I went home and I and I and my friend came with me and like we bought a shitload of heroin and Xanax and I did clean the house. But I, I went home to get high because I couldn't handle the night at that hospital. And I still still feel horrible about that. And spoiler alert for the second Maybe I was in the hospital and I stayed the night for our second baby sober. So I made up for it. Thank God. Gross. But Look, this- but that's gross. <laughs> you know, you, you did it different the second time, right? It's crazy growth. But yeah. that kind of secret mm-hmm. was a terror. It was like the most terrifying secret I ever had because Linda's world and our baby Nora's world were contingent on me not doing it. Yeah. And I did it anyway. And I didn't tell her this secret. Like, that's not how she found out. She found out um, was one night and we were living in Astoria Mm -hmm. and um, we had this railroad apartment and I had an office on one side and the other side was kind of our living room, our bedroom, and then the baby's room. She said goodnight to me. And when she said goodnight to me, I figured that's when I could shoot up. And I went to the other room to shoot up. Yeah. And then um, I shot up and then I drew up another shot and I lay down on the couch in my office 
where I got a lot of work done. And um, <laughs> he's using I, air I quotes, like, just so you know, guys. Yeah. He's using air quotes. <laughs> but you guys can't hear. You can't hear the air quotes. Um, so I, I put I put the needle on my stomach or something, and I lay down. And then she came to the door, mm-hmm. and she was like, "Oh, I wanted to kiss you good night." And um, and I thought she saw the needle, but she didn't see it. And I just told her, I was like, oh my God, I was like, I have this needle I'm, I'm using. And that's how she found out. Um, and the baby, you know, was, was uh, six months old when she Ooh. found out. Yeah. And she called her dad. Her dad was a, an ex Navy boxer, weightlifting librarian. He was also a librarian, but he was all those tough things first before he was a librarian. And he was like, tell Dave to get the fuck out of the house or I'm going to fucking kill him, you know? And I, and I left Mm -hmm. and then she left with the baby. And that's, that was like the worst secret I ever had. When you came clean in that moment and what was her reaction when you finally revealed that secret before you, you left? She, uh, she either said, you need to leave right now. Or she said, I need to leave. I don't remember what it was. I think she she said, I need to leave. And Mm -hmm. she took her phone. And mm-hmm. she went out and she called her parents and then, and then she called her dad and her dad just, and she said, Dave, you got to go. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. she didn't, yeah. I don't remember her. I think she was, she was just angry. You know, her go, she got really angry. She didn't get sad. She didn't get crazy. She got really angry. And then, um, yeah. and then she left. Um, and, uh, mm. and it took me, took me a long time to get sober you know I didn't I didn't like I, it wasn't like that happened and I got sober at all like that happened yeah. and that year was like one of the worst years of my using life you know I like my yeah. it got up to like $300 a day it was it was crazy just total chaos misery uh I went to treatment um I got like a year, but then I, I, I backslid on weed and pills. You know, it took me uh, five years from then to actually become like, like actually sober, like sober with a person. not like, not like California sober, but like actually sober, yeah. clean, yeah, clean. Not, it was, I had years of California sober, which I really enjoyed as well, but it was not, it wasn't like, I didn't have a chance to do what I wanted to do with my California sober. Like that wasn't, yeah. it wasn't going to work for me. No. And usually doesn't work for people that do heroin are those kind of things. You don't get to be California sober or kind of sober. It's just not an option because we are addicted to not living in ourselves. But I have to say, like, I'm really proud of her for like walking away from you. <laughs> like, Bravo to her because so many people didn't and having a six month old baby on top of it, like the fear and the, the disappointment for her probably made you spiral into that shame. Right. Well, I think she had a really tough line, right. She had a really hard line with it. And then she was just, she was fucking hardcore. And then she like started dating like, like six months, like shortly after, like three or four months later, she started dating. And I was like, I was like, wow. I was like, you know, and, and it, but still I, like what you said in the beginning, like I couldn't get mm-hmm. sober for her or my kid Mm-mm. or whatever. It was, what happened was the reason I got sober was because I just saw myself and I, and I have a great father as annoying, as I said, my first secret was about him as annoying as he can be. He was a really great father and is a great father. And I saw mm-hmm. myself as this checked out, no count dad and I just didn't want to live with that, you know, so that, that right. was like people say, oh, it's because of Nora. And I said, no, it was because I couldn't live with with who I was, you know, because I didn't want her to have the pressure of being either the matchmaker or the savior. You know, it was it was piece of it, 100 percent. And it was like the greatest joy I have is being a sober father. It's like amazing. But I did it because I couldn't handle who I was. 
Yeah. Well, she, well, here's the thing. Children are mirrors for us. I haven't experienced this now with my son and my sobriety, especially being addicted to people and it's a child and you want to mesh, but he's a mirror for me. Like how your child sees you, how you're showing up for them can really save your life, but you have to make that decision for yourself. And you saw in that mirror, how ugly of a father you were turning into. And that's what stopped you, right? It was, it was, I couldn't live with it. I could not live. Yeah. And like life is short, life is long, whatever. If you have a life that you don't like, if you can really see it, for me, eventually that became the impetus for change. It was really a a long, dumb story where me and Linda, Linda tried to work it out with me, but I had already started Mm -hmm. doing my California sober thing and she found out and she was like, you're going to lose custody again, right? And I found myself one night in August in 2015, writing her an email, begging her to let me smoke pot and keep my custody. It was like a hundred degrees. I'm like chain smoking Marlboro's typing. And um, I was just like, what the fuck am I doing? Like, and, and the insanity, like, and that right? was my, my moment of clarity. That was my, like, I need to try something different. That was your dark night of the soul. That's what I call it. That dark night of the soul. When you see the insanity that you are wanting to keep this weed so bad and begging to have this weed and also have custody. Like that's insane. Right. And, and it's like, and what are you, it's like, what is the weed? Like, it's like when I talked about needing Linda to feel good about myself, it's like, and here I am mm-hmm. doing the same thing with fucking weed. And it's like, it's like, how little do I value myself in that situation? And I realized like I was 41 and it was half my life. I had a, a waiter job mm-hmm. at a deli. I had a, a sublet on the Lower East Side. And that was everything I had to show for if I'm lucky, I'll live to be 82. So that was half my life. And I was like, well, what would another 41 years be if I don't do that? If I do it soberly, what could I, what could I earn? What kind of joy can I have? What kind of life will I have? And it's been an amazing lesson. You know what I mean? Like I'm, I'm shocked really. I never would have imagined that it would be so good on the side of it. Really? I know. I have to say the same thing. Like I never imagined how much freedom you felt because before it felt like, oh, that is everything that gives me the freedom, the drugs, the people, the alcohol, whatever gives me the freedom. But real freedom is literally you don't need it. You don't need anything. You don't need Linda. You don't need your daughter. You don't need the weed. You don't need anything. And you feel that like you're OK. Right. Right. Yeah, And that's the that's absolute freedom. Now, let me ask you a question, because yeah. I know we're on a time frame here, but you know that song, me and Bobby McGee. Freedom is just another word for nothing left to lose. What the fuck does that mean? Free. I mean, like, how does that fit in? Because I think you just defined freedom really nicely. So freedom is just another word for nothing left to lose. So that's what you're saying when you go. That's what I'm saying. There you go. I think you just did it. Freedom for me. Yeah. Is if my husband can leave me, my son can leave me, my career can leave me, my money, my looks, everything can leave me and I am okay. Right. And I never felt that until I did this work till I got on the other side. And that's the freedom where you are okay. Hands off the wheel, take it or leave it. And I am okay. I love that. I think that's brilliant. Oh, I love having you on. We could literally talk forever. I, I will keep talking, but I do want to ask you if someone is listening and they're tied to that weed or they're tied to that thing where they can't let go, whether it's like porn or or their girlfriend or wife where they think they need her, what would be the advice you would have for them if they're struggling right now? It's, it's, it's interesting. It's like, the first question is, what are you willing to do? I guess the, the, the number one thing is you talk to somebody that you know that maybe found freedom. Start there. Mm-hmm. You know, that's the, the easiest thing where like, if somebody gets to talk to you, like, and you could put it in the, the, the kind of perspective that you just put it with me or how I could talk to them or the, or some of the people that I know, like it, the, they say, you know, one addict helping another is without parallel. It's like, that's the, the, the greatest ability to understand each other. So I would say that's the first thing, reach out to somebody that has some uh, recovery. And if you don't know anybody, go to a meeting. And if you can't find a meeting, find a meeting on zoom or like, you know, talk to people, find a therapist, talk to somebody, somebody will point you in the right direction. I a hundred percent agree. And also just to like 
that moment when you had for yourself, that self-reflective moment are so rare, that dark night of the soul moment that I had as well in the mirror, when I was like going to go down that path again, those rarely happen. So if you have that moment, jump on it because that was like the savior. That was the thing was like, I don't want to be doing this till I'm 80. And you had it like, I don't want to be doing this till I'm 82, (laughs) you know? Right. No. So, and then the other thing is like, I think my, I I think what you said is perfect. And, And one thing that I think about kind of on a daily basis is I make this decision not to do it. And it's like any day I could do it any day. I could get high. I could get weed. I could get drugs. But the thing that I do is I consistently don't do it because, mm-hmm. and it's not, I'm not saying that people don't relapse and, and things happen and whatever. I get it. I don't want to fuck with it. I, I make the decision not to do it every day because I'm not tempted either. I, I just think about the fact that I'm amassing all these days because I chose every day not to do it. That's the secret to recovery by, by participating yeah. in it on a minute to minute basis, on a daily basis, weekly, monthly, yearly, whatever, just keep going. If you keep going, it's never, it's going to get better and better and better. Every time I choose today to be sober, I choose today not to do it. And I can always do it tomorrow. So it takes that like need to like, (gasps) you know, and the more days you get, the less that goes away. Like I said, I don't have any temptation to act out at all whatsoever. But if I'm not diligent with my recovery every day in a matter of weeks, I will be tempted because someone will trigger the shit out of me. And that's just how it happens. You know, thank you for coming on. Please tell people about your podcast, which is an amazing podcast and where they can find you. And if they have questions or need support. Yeah, check out Dopey, Dopey Podcast. It's available wherever you find podcasts. We have a listener base called the Dopey Nation. Dopey Nation actually does Zooms, 26, 26 Zooms a week they do, international. Um, and they do oh AA, God, NA, it. fucking SLA, Smart Recovery. They do everything. Uh, Dharma, and then they have fun. You know, so uh, Dopey is available wherever your podcast is available and on iTunes and in YouTube, but our YouTube following is sad. So don't judge me for that. It's okay. We don't even have a YouTube following because most of my guests are anonymous. So we're like, fuck the YouTube, like who we're going to be just me talking to myself. Like that would be, so I'm sure yours is better than ours. So congrats. For that. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> and I really do appreciate you having me on. It was a lot of fun. Thank you so much. And if you want to be on the show, please email me at secret life podcast at iCloud.com until next time. Thanks again for listening to the show. Please subscribe, rate, share, or send me a note at secretlifepodcast.com. And if you'd like to check out my book, head over to secretlifenovel.com or Amazon to pick up a copy for yourself or someone you love. Thanks again. See you soon. Did you guys know there's a medication that is proven to treat migraines and prevent episodic migraines in adults? It's called Nurtec ODT. Remedjapan, 75 milligrams. If you suffer from migraine attacks, talk to your doctor to see if Nurtec ODT is right for you. Don't take if you're allergic to Nurtec ODT. The most common side effects were nausea, stomach pain, and indigestion. For important safety prescribing and patient information, visit nurtec.com. Sometimes you need to take control to make a difference. That's why with FlexPath from Capella University, you're in control. Set your own deadlines and leverage your experience to move at a pace that works for you. Discover a different way forward at capella.edu.